Welcome. Uh, this is um, this is so exciting. I know so many of you are excited about this, and in planning this event, I've heard from so many of you who have um, talked about the ways Public Enemy has changed and informed your lives. Uh, the common refrain has been, "Wow, Chuck D is coming. He changed my life." <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, Chuck D is one of the most politically and socially conscious artists and public intellectuals of my generation, really of any generation. So many of us came into political consciousness as a result of his music. I'm excited, too, to introduce you to the work of my friend, Gay, Dr. Gay Teresa Johnson. I've known Gay for almost 20 years, as we met when we were in our mid to late 20s, just young whippersnappers. <laughs> Enduring the rigors of graduate school in a very cold Minneapolis. <laughs> wow, this Minneapolis is representing. <laughs> in fact, we were work with Steve Waxman, who's in the audience too. We were on the same graduate program together. <laughs> um, I knew right away, as many of you will feel tonight, that I was in the presence of greatness. We took many courses together, and though we studied with some truly outstanding scholars, I often learned more from Gay than I learned from anyone else. When she, she and Chuck found one another, I was not surprised. Well, I was a little surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but I was really happy, as any girlfriend would be, because I knew she had truly met her match. Gay and I have talked about doing this event for many, many years, so I'm so thankful that this day has come and I hope you can all feel how this is an event that is grounded in a great deal of love. The love that comes from friendship, the love of marriage and companionship, and the love from the shared commitment to creating a world based on human dignity and social equity. So our guests, I'm gonna introduce these folks and then I'm gonna introduce our facilitator who's gonna share the introduction with me. Um, so Chuck D, leader. <laughs> As you all know already, he is the leader and co-founder of the legendary rap group Public Enemy. He redefined rap music and hip hop culture with the release of PE's explosive deb debut album, Yo Bun Rush The Show, in 1987. <laughs> Since then, Public Enemy has completed 86 tours in 85 countries, and they're still going strong. Public Enemy has sold to date over 10 million albums. In 2013, Chuck was recognized by what is universally known as one of the highest honors in music. Along with Public Enemy, he was inducted into the 2013 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> he is the recipient of numerous awards and accolades, the author of two books, and he continues to work on commentary, music, and writing on diversity, rap, and reality. He has also been a national spokesperson for the Rock the Vote, the National Urban League, and the National Alliance for African American Athletes. And he is on the advisory board for the Sankofa Foundation, convened by Harry Belafonte to radicalize artists and orient them to social movement activism. Dr. Gay Teresa Johnson. <laughs> Who knew way back then when we were in grad school, this is where we would be now, right? <laughs> she is Associate Professor of Black Studies with affiliations in the Departments of History and Chicana Chicano Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She writes and teaches on race and racism, cultural history, geographies of freedom, and political economy. She too is very active. She's been active with the Los Angeles Community Action Network Struggle for Housing and Civil Rights in the LA Skid Row, and she received their, received their 2013 Freedom Now Award for her efforts. Yeah. 
She's also the founding partner of Soul Sisters Rising, a women's collective de dedicated to elevating women of color in film. I recommend that you all go to the, check out the website. You'll find it's just Soul Sisters. If you Google Soul Sisters Rising, you'll find it, S-O-L Sisters. Uh, and again, dedicated to elevating women of color in film, and she might talk about that a little bit tonight, too. Um, Johnson's first book is Spaces of Conflict, Sounds of Solidarity, Music, Race, and Spatial Entitlement in Los Angeles. And it's a history of civil rights and spatial struggles among black and brown freedom seekers and cultural workers in LA. And you can learn more about the book tomorrow at 4.30 in Graham Auditorium in the Fine Arts Center in Brown Fine Arts Building. She's going to be doing a book talk, and there'll, there'll be um, a chance for you to kind of learn more about this absolutely beautiful book, um, which I'll, I'll, I'm going to do the intro for that, so I'll save my love for that book for then. And our facilitator, the REC. <laughs> I really don't think there's anybody who could facilitate this quite like him. So I'm really thankful and honored that he agreed to do this today for us. He is a PhD student in the Language, Literacy, and Culture program in the School of Ed at UMass Amherst. He's currently instructor, thank thankfully, of Latino and Latina studies and Latin American studies at Smith College. He has taught in the Valley for many years, including at Hampshire College, UMass Amherst, Greenfield Community College, and Holyoke Community College. He has taught and mentored incarcerated youth in Springfield and directed the Teen Resource Center in Holyoke. He is co-founder and host of Trigger Media Collective with Professor Chris Tinson. <laughs> And they broadcast live every Friday, 6 to 8, 91.1 .1 FM. Don't sleep. It's a beautiful show. Really get to know what's going on in the Valley around activism, culture. It's just a beautiful show. I recommend it highly. I should also add that um, Carlos, otherwise known as Rec, is a very skilled DJ. You can check him out at, at Ibiza here in Northampton this Saturday night. <laughs> where he'll be spinning with none other than special guest DJ, the legendary Jorge Popmaster Fable Pabon. So please help me in giving all three of these amazing people a very, very warm welcome. Uh, good evening, beautiful people. Good evening. I'm super nervous, but I'm okay with that. This is important, and uh, it's very personal for me. Uh, before I get into everything, I want to thank uh, some of the main sponsors, co-sponsors. There are a number of sponsors that supported this event, and uh, too much to list, but we are going to thank some of those most pertinent sponsors, if you will, um, and uh, they're as follow. Um, Lynn Minnick, uh, the Administrative Assistant of the History Department, Patrick Conley, and the Office of Student Engagement, the Student Events Committee, the Res Life Social Justice Committee, the Wurzel Center for Work and Life, the Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity, and the Five College Lecture Fund. Please, round of applause for them. This event will be structured with an hour dialogue, and uh, we will have a half an hour Q&A at the end. Uh, we ask that uh, NCTV, give it up for NCTV, North, Northampton Community Television, will be filming this event. So it will be available for viewing by next week via the Smith College History Department website. Uh, only the main speakers will be filmed, not the audience or anyone going to the mics during the Q&A. And uh, we ask that you refrain from filming or taking photos during the event, but are welcome to do so after, uh, afterward. And a reminder to please turn off the ringers on your cell phones. We have a couple of fellas that no one can see right now on deck in case we have a cell phone that goes off. You might be escorted out of the, out of the building. With love, of course. <laughs> All right. I was a part of a generation of folks who had been failed by a public school system. Our classrooms were in the streets. 
We moved as units throughout sleepless summer nights living. While violence existed, there was a strong sense of dignity that was prevalent within an urban landscape we called home. The real violence we experienced was often perpetuated by the systems that were in place to keep the wealth of self-worth low. Humiliation at the welfare office, experiences with racist law enforcement, etc. There was a love of pride that overshadowed ailing, disenfranchised communities back then. We were a mesh of black and brown tradition derived from an African diaspora. Our techniques to resist and survive were genius. When death occurred, phenomenal art pieces found residency among neighborhood walls, immortalizing the narratives of those fallen. When we gathered to celebrate life, whether in Dizzy's basement or Simon's yearly bash, the Roseland or 98th in Amsterdam, also known as Rock Study Park, there would always be that moment when we would go to war on a dance floor, each with a mastery over a set of moves that would swiftly deconstruct an opponent's being, all without touch, sharp maneuvers cutting down any evidence of reputation. We were a beautiful people with much style and who knew how to love beyond material, beyond monetary figure, a real love that existed deep within struggle. The music was church for us. Wherever we were, the music lifted us out of those dark place, places and brought us light. Public enemy allowed us to exist as one. We knew what the power was and we were willing to fight for our right to exist. Chuck D's lyrics would rattle through giant subwoofers in the back of 98s and deliver sermons that made us feel invincible, proud to be black and brown. That time period would instill in me the will to always uphold the narratives of those struggles, to never compromise the integrity of the richness of our culture for the sake of acceptance. Fast forward years later on the heels of wrapping up a degree I had no intentions of ever pursuing. I stand idle with the same tenacity of honoring those legacies, trans traditions, and ancestors. Only today I feel the sense of urgency of an inflating prison industrial complex. Surrounding myself with a community of like-minded scholars who allowed me to understand and realize the significance of political prisoners. Today, with America's public version of the hunting games, <laughs> where black and brown young men pay the heavy toll, innocent lives laid to rest, I welcome you all to a dialogue of possibilities, histories, family, and love. And as my brother Dr. Tinson said, we cannot achieve solidarity without knowing struggle. So I ask you all to join us as we embark on this journey. So thank you all, and, and you know, in the interest of time, and I want to make sure that we, we have plenty of it to uh, go around. And those who know me know that I'm really about the sincere love and the building. And uh, what I hope we get into tonight is just straight authenticity, and uh, we're going to set it off. So Gay, I'm going to set it off with you, and, and I'm wondering if you can share with us that moment, and Chuck as well, uh, when you first realized the commitment that you would make to do this work. And as we progress, the idea, the definition of the work, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we can talk a little more about that. But share with us that moment when you said to yourself, this is what I need to do. This is what I'm committing myself to. I mean, this is one of those moments for me, right? I mean, especially after I hear that incredible introduction from both of these wonderful people. But I mean, to hear the poem that you, the, the music that you gave us tonight is so important. Thank you so much. 
And thank you all, everybody, for coming and being here with us and building here with us. Um, uh, you know, for me, um, one of the most important and significant moments in my life was um, was it was actually a long moment when I, I first got to college and felt like I, I couldn't figure out why. I mean, I knew I was a good student. I knew I was smart. Um, I was really blessed to have parents who would tell me that on a daily basis. But, um, but I couldn't figure out why I couldn't connect in college. And then it was like towards the end of the academic year and I was in a, in a classroom and really thinking about whether or not it was the place for me. And in fact, in a class that I thought, the minute this is over, I'm gonna drop this class because it's, it's just too much, the theory, the whatever, I'm feeling like so disconnected all over again. And then in order to demonstrate what he was talking about, this professor played a song I'd only ever heard in my parents' living room. And that was the first time I'd ever seen myself in a classroom. I had never seen myself represented historically, socially, in any way valued in terms of my own life experience. And to, you know, at the time I didn't have the words really to express this, but now in hindsight, I see the power of that moment um, to have someone validate your life experience, validate the, the, the music you listen to that you may never feel that you have an audience to share it with in, in halls like these, mm -hmm. and made me feel like, like I saw something there and that it was good. And that was a moment I knew that I wanted to do for other people what this person had done for me, even if I didn't know if it was teaching or writing or whatever, but I knew that that was, that was gonna be my life. And then I feel like since then, I've had these moments of recommitment where I've realized that someone's story has been shared with me and now I'll take it with me wherever I go, but also have a, a, an obligation and an honor to represent it with dignity mm. and to bring to it, um, bring to other people the, the, the dignity that often is, is robbed from so many of us about just the most basic things about our lives. I mean, so many of us have been made to feel that even the people who teach us despise us. And so to have that, to, to know even just for a moment, you only have this moment, and if you're on the street or if you're in the classroom or you're in a library or wherever you are, if, just, to, just to recommit in those moments. I mean, it all, for me, comes back to that, to that moment, yeah. Thank you. I'd like to say greetings, and um, this is where everybody's at, huh? <laughs> this corner of Massachusetts. I saw Rosa, I said, yeah, this is where everybody's at. Uh, and you must be less nervous with that incredible speech. <laughs> Appreciate that. I'm rolling with you. Um, <laughs> being born black or Negro in 1960 in New York brought some weird advantages to go through the whole decade and not having to read a book about the 60s and having lived through it and witness assassinations, uh, Vietnam War, uncles coming back with um, silver or whatever, medals of whatever, of getting injured and damaged and putting them on your G.I. Joes <laughs> and going into the 70s. That whole 10-year period, I sponged it in and um, moving out to Roosevelt, Long Island, being part of a, of a program that took place in the 19, summer of 1970 called the African Afro-American Experience on the college campus of Hofstra, where all of us would bust as a summer program and it happened to be all kinds of college students, um, uh, people from the Nation of Islam, Black Panthers, and they were our teachers that summer. <laughs> gave a weird effect going right back into Roosevelt in the uh, fall of 1970, where it set inside of us a seed to, to know that we got a summer of knowledge of self, as well as we you know, had the Panther Lunch program going on and liked to go in the pool and played around and joked around as 10 and 11 year olds. But that seed sprouted in each and every one of us from the square mile town of Roosevelt. And so the understanding of who we were started to set in. Although I had sort of like 
parents who allowed me to be independent along with my brothers and sisters, my brother and my sister. But everybody in the town of Roosevelt had this sense of independence because we all went to that, that damn summer program <laughs> and challenged teachers in the fifth grade like, nah. You. And they was like, we got to stop this summer program. We got to give you all a summer program that has, makes you have fun and not know about you know, Marcus Garvey and people like that. <laughs> And those Panther people who, and this Joanne Chesimard, and who are these people, and you know, and Squeaky From, and all that. So that sprouted something in us. And so when I was able to go to, to college, and you know, we were challenging. It's something this, this seed sprouted into challenge information. Just don't believe a hype, no matter what it comes through. And the turning point for me, and I just think that. Um, I believe that you have to stay consistent, but in the blizzard of whippings of mass distraction, you always have to find a way to adapt and reinvent yourself. So I reinvented myself when I was unsure and still held onto that seed. So when I was a college student in the late 70s and the early 80s, I, was happened, I happened to be alongside a cluster of individuals that felt like-minded like I did and we had the beginnings of hip hop to ride alongside to disguise our angst and our attitudes and ride with it. And so the beginnings of Public Enemy came because it was a collective. It never was an individual thing. And anytime somebody claps for me as being a, a, an individual, I somehow just like, well, this is, this is beyond me. It's not for me because we always came as a we. And at the beginning of R&B, which was Reagan and Bush, If you, if you came with a goddamn eye, you got that dot smacked the hell off of it. So you had to come with some kind of we. And that's what, that was the turning point. Dick Gregory came to Adelphi in 1981 and reaffirmed to myself that yes, you can be in entertainment, but you can change the world in whatever you do, be it music, comedy or whatever. And of course, I was raised on Curtis Mayfield, Miriam Makiba in the household, and people was able to, to break Ivan Dixon and nothing but a man. All these things I knew about always before I was 15. But seeing Dick Gregory in person on the Delphi University in 1982 flipped me out because he had everybody cracking up. And, he, and at the end of his, I, didn't even, I can't even call it a lecture, it was ex an experience. At the end, it was so quiet, and everybody was so glued to the stage. Some people had to leave. It was like, wow, he just made, he turned the crowd out one way and turned it out another way. And that was the turning point for me. No doubt, thank you. Um, uh, my next question is, as you both were sharing, I'm thinking right now about the young folks. I mean, there are a lot of scholars, a lot of folks that I, you know, I roll with here and folks that I respect and admire. Um, but there are also a lot of students and folks that might be outside of the academy in, in this uh, setting. So share with us as you're progressing and you're getting this foot hold or you, you know you you find a space that you feel like now you can start growing share with us kind of the bob and weave you know moments because often we get inspired we see something and then the reality of reality slaps us in the face and for those folks that that might not have that support within the institution or however that are in the group you know what you know share with them you know some of the things that you've been through but how you were able to kind of and move forward, you know. My wife is very good at making sure that you're focusing in on the person you're talking to and listening to them. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. I think what, is, what has been absent the last 25 years and being on this earth 54 years, I think I can judge the last 25 years. <laughs> I don't get drunk, I ain't, I'm clear as hell. The individual, you know, we've, we've seen collectives boil down to individuals. And in this system, they, re they reward individuals for all kinds of, you know what, um, and for all kinds of reasons, which is you have to watch out for that. But I just think when it comes down to generational talk, 
I've never blamed the young for anything. Mm -hmm. And how young is young anyway? Right. When somebody 16 comes to me and t tells me that they're young, I'm like, well, my daughter is too. You ain't younger than that. <laughs> so it, 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 it's about never ducking out, especially the next decade, I mean, the next generation. And generations are every five years. So whenever you don't have a cluster of people in their 20s who might have been forsaken for people in, in their earlier days to, to easily break it down and talk to them, when you have 20s talking to teenagers in a progressive way, if you don't have 30-year-olds talking to 20-year-olds, and I don't mean to just to say it decade-wise, but if you don't have that, that, that bridge working like that, you cannot expect an old guard to talk to a young guard and expect it to be smooth. So that's been missing. Because when I was coming up, and this is also before gun and drug culture, the rites of passage, that next layer of, of that next 10 to 15 years, you had to respect. And then you didn't, and you didn't give them props because they had money. You didn't know what they had. You just knew that they had a collective that was more than you or just as, as powerful as you, and they had everything sold up. So you had to grow into that, or you had to meet that. And, um, but gun and, gun and drug culture changed all that during, once again, R&B. And um, matter of fact, when we were coming in, I had a thing laid out called, who's gonna stop hip hop from being the prison industrial complex one-stop shop? But that's a whole nother thing here. <laughs> in an hour, it's impossible. But there's something to that because the generational rites of passage, and you have to talk to a person now seriously. What can you talk to? Can you talk to their soul and to you talk to their heart and make them feel good about themselves with what they already got? And that, that's an obligation. My wife's very good at, 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 at reinforcing that with me, listening to a person who might feel in this society feels that they have nothing, feels that they're nobody. And this society is driven on the fact to make you feel like if you don't have things or if you ain't sucking up to some core plantation, you know, that you are nothing. And you got to get this look on. You got to have this in your pocket. You got to got this whip to drive. And when this is a 15 to 17 to 20 year poison, how do you reverse that? It's going to take a lot of one on one thing, you know, stop looking at the quantity of the situation and really delve into the quality of the second, the minute, the person, the heart, the soul. And I think that's a start beyond whatever agenda or whatever politic you might have. Can you listen to someone who seemingly feels that they're below you? Okay. Please. Applause be taking half the time away. <laughs> it's like when I be listening, I, you know, you look at these speeches on TV and uh, the biggest farce is like when they, you know, what, 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 the, what the State of the Union, Union speech, you gotta, you gotta hear me kind of like rant in my house sometimes. It's like, oh, here we go again. I gotta try to not to sound like an old, crazy, cantankerous dude. But, you know, the president talks, and then everybody, all the fake cats, they all, oh, I'm like, damn, they drowned out half of what he got to say. <laughs> Not even hearing what he got to say. Not to talk about y'all in a bad way, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's like, I don't even get it. I, it's just like a lot of things. Maybe that's that Negro 1960 type thing going on. <laughs> yeah, I have Negro on my birth certificate, by the way. I keep it framed as a reminder. Y'all with us, right? <laughs> okay, so I, I want to move into uh, I want to move into family, but I wanted to ask both of you all to share a little bit about. And Chuck, you you touched on this uh, briefly, and Gay in your book you talk about this, but talk about the the institutions that were in place that began to disappear, crumble. You know, those, you know, the, the organizations that were in the community, you know, the movements. Talk about that shift and how that affected the landscape of, of what was going on within these urban communities. Um, I just finished teaching 
um, we're on our spring break actually at UCSB, and this is the first time I taught the civil rights movement, history of the civil rights movement. And, you know, U University of California, Santa Barbara has the, uh, the students have the highest, um, they're, they're the richest kids in the system, in, in, in the UC system, which says a lot, a lot. Because the University of California is the largest chain of universities in the world, and they have a lot, a lot of money for a public institution. They charge a lot of money for a public institution. UCSB is kind of the apex of that um, area. We have a lot of kids there who are living, um, you know, kind of like the dream of urban planners in the 1950s and 1960s, where they fantasized about Los Angeles in particular being this place that, for example, my friend Eric Avila calls a, the, the Western outpost of white supremacy. It's a place where, you know, um, freeways destroyed people's homes and livelihoods, their dreams, their futures. Um, but also, it's a, it's a set of racialized fantasies that people have had about these landscapes that, are, that include higher education that don't see a crowd like this, of many different kind of people who believe in freedom and who seek it on a daily basis. So um, when I teach a class like that, it has real significance in the place that I'm in. And I'm always really conscious about the places, the actual physical places where people have come from, but also the discursive space that they inhabit in their minds about who is teaching them and whether or not even I have a right to be there. To, and I get this all the time, and, and I'm sure many of us who are professors of color, we have these things we deal with. We deal with these things, these challenges to our legitimacy. And so when I speak about this history of the eradication of our institutions that have assured collective success, those institutions that have been built just since 1970 and the ways that Reagan, that Bush, that Clinton, that people have systematically taken them down, then the civil rights movement becomes a completely different thing temporally because my students then come to understand that all of the you know the things that they learned or did not learn about what civil rights is or wasn't um, have now ha now have to be reevaluated because all of the things we struggled for and really got in terms of like black studies and some of these incredible after school programs all of those things that we achieved by a certain point in time we're struggling for all over again sometimes in the exact same physical spaces mm -hmm. they were already in right. so it's very difficult for them to grasp since the air they breathe contains this narrative about black gradual but persistent uplift since 1865 because you we were freed in 65 and then you know things just got better and better and better now you got your president so why y'all you know complaining so so this is i mean you know we we're greeted with this sort of assaulted with this every day i think in terms of all of the kind of work that we do whether we're in the in academy or we're anywhere else but um, I think that one of the most important things for me has been to show students how these after-school programs, these free breakfast programs, Upward Bound, all of these things were started by these incredibly radical third world internationalist groups like the Panthers, like the Young Lords, like the Chicano Movement, Brown Berets, who knew that, you know what, I can't do, it's kind of like what, what um, um, Felipe Luciano says, you know, like, we go into the community and we were so excited, like, what are we going to do? We're going to start a revolution. And they say, they say, yeah, exactly. They said, whatever, coño con eso, right? It's like, it, la basura, pick up the trash in the, in the community. Like, they're not picking up the trash. It's that, that, that stuff that people realize, you know what, in order to educate people, in order for people to be part of something, to change something, we got to feed them in the morning. We got to feed them breakfast, you know, we got to, so to, to, to change the narrative, to show people that look it's not as if this was the pinnacle of some sort of uh, uh, a gradual transformation of the consciousness or conscience of humankind that frees people or grants them money for to create these institutions we fought we created we created I mean we dreamed these things we created them we institutionalized them with no money and that we asked for them we demanded them we died for them and then they gave us a little bit of money and then they took it away 
So now I think what here we are again, and I think the danger it has been that collectively, especially young people, have been convinced of the fiction that collective action doesn't work because it's people think that it's not needed at all because we already have everything we want. And every and the reason why people think that, I think it has something to do with fame. And I, I know you'll be able to say so well, everybody wants to be famous, like in some way or another. Like it's a real thing now. People want but but there's something about digital culture and social networking that has been so powerfully transformative and so important, especially now people are starting to talk about the power of like the black Twitterverse, right? What you can do right. to affect these changes. But it has also created these incredible distractions, these incredible um, fallacies of, of, of what we believe to be true and right and just for, especially for black people and brown people. Mm -hmm. We believe that just because we have e the equal access to own an iPhone, mm -hmm. that we can look at the same things, we can share the same visual stories or listen to the same audio, that somehow that makes us all somehow deeply equal, when in fact it's never been worse in a lot of ways. Right. So I think this is one of the main challenges that we, we face right now and, 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 and trying to then convince even the people who need those institutions the most mm -hmm. that there's a history here and you know that in many ways you're the butt of the joke and so how do you how do you transform I mean first of all how do you hit people to that fact but then convince them that they're not victims I think is a is the work we're about Chuck did you want um, I, I wanted to, uh, man, I'm, I'm, well, I'm just like somebody. saying, just like information, when information, no matter where you're at in this, in this day, yep. this day is not like 2004, 2006. There's been devices that have been invented since, well, has been in the marketplace since 2010, such as smartphones, which your ass better be smarter than your phone, <laughs> that you really have to pay attention to these high, tech devices stay on top of them you will never master them but you can manage them or just you know go backyard and leave them alone but if they're going to be in your presence it's like eating fish you eat what's edible if you choose to eat fish and make sure you don't choke on the bones <laughs> that's real talk <laughs> because all these things are out there like look there's something in somebody taking 6,000 selfies of themselves. Something that there's the lack of knowledge of self, but the quest of knowledge of self is not there, so it's answered by taking a selfie. <laughs> and then also, phones and these devices, people think, well, they're the human remote to the world. Without thinking, if you're not on top of understanding that you have to pay attention to every second coming at you, these are remotes, but the remotes to the areas of court plantations that are looking to maneuver your ass. So they work inward. So if you got it to actually have an output, and those who are, who are taught the arts, those who are taught expression, communication, use these devices as output. If you're using these devices for entertainment, or better yet, you look to be entertained because the arts in you were never enhanced or the expression in, in you were never enhanced, which a structure of schooling is supposed to do, enhance your ability to be artistic. You know, the, art, the earth without art is just eh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So everybody has this, every, but well, once you turn art into being something of a commodity and it has to be sold, then you have to beware the next levels of steps of, of control and reflection turning into dictation and then all of a sudden people think I, oh, this is my thing no this thing was already told to be your thing planned on the blueprint of a boardroom to be your thing 10 years ago when you was four mm -hmm. now you're 14 you think you're making your own decisions like you know it's like the government in this country so I, I make very clear statements like when I when I heard you know of course uh, thank you Jennifer for that read she on can cook on, by the way too yeah, really on, cook food, food. <laughs> yes and that read on me like the internet when you have in information it's like space debris too it's just floating out there so when I heard rock the vote and I heard um, 
Urban League. I was like as silent as the people. Like, oh, oh, oh. So, <laughs> I was in the 90s, 20 years ago. But it's like space degree, uh, debris. So you always got to kind of like reinvent your place, especially when everything is available. People are, are volu- thinking it's an a honor to volunteer for Big Brother now. Oh, please, Big Brother, please be my Big Brother. And, he, he, and these are people who are alongside us making critical decisions on our surroundings. And we have a prison industrial complex that has turned into be a, 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 a receiving home for people who have given in to the climate that have been dictated still by so many, I mean, by the few that choose to destroy so many. And so um, my thing was people, I, you know, what have I said the last two years that make any sense in relevancy? I tell my wife all the time, I'm not no damn U.S. citizen, I'm an Earthison. Because if I've been to 95 countries on a regular, I look at the Earth, I don't see like A-U-S-T-R when I look down at Australia. There's a nerve for Americans to call themselves Americans. I call them USAers. Because you don't own all the goddamn America. And say, well, what's your religion, Chuck? Well, hip hop is my religion because I look deep within. What's rap? Rap is my military because I'm out to see if I could provide service and protect those in the arts. And if anybody got a problem with it, they could go to hell. Or or better yet, like Amherst, they could go to L. L. Yeah, we pronounce the H in Amherst, y'all. That's what it is. So I reinvent my, I think it's important in the digital age to reinvent yourself because things are coming to knock parts of your head and your body off in these fast blizzard digital times. And then you're looking at a whole bunch of people who have been filled with digital expressions of not of themselves or their true self, but of what poured in it, like the, you know, the old Kool-Aid jugs. Mm-hmm. They just, whatever you pour in it, that's what the jug is, you know? <laughs> you pour strawberry in, it's a strawberry Kool-Aid jug. So this is what the digital era will do to you if you don't manage these things in your pocket, in your hand. These things have been in the marketplace only five, six years. There ain't too much studies on these things, but you know they can, overtake you real quick, and they have. I shouldn't say they could. You're looking at the masses out there who the court plantation considered them asses. They just moved the M over. <laughs> and they already, they know that they got their minds, body, soul, money that they about to get, money they ain't got. They got people praising to the, the money who it, which ain't worth the, the, the paper it's printed on. You know, or today what the IRS says, oh, Bit- Bitcoin doesn't count. <laughs> Internal revenue in the United States says this. Okay. Well. <laughs> it, it becomes a joke, and it, but it is serious. So where fantasy and reality bleeds back and forth, you got to make sure that it ain't coming out of your veins and brain. You just got to stay on top. And most people in your surrounding will not be on top of what's to come and what's happening now. And that's the burden that you will face. That's the burden we all face. People always talk about, oh, oh, y'all, y'all good, y'all good. We surrounded by friends, family, community that might not get it that we have to be a burden for, we have to hold up the burden. You know, family, people of color, oh man, I seen you on TV, you good. Man, you know how many people attached to me? Just not even talk about family. Just about, you know, having a group of, and a people of 50 people requires a lot of maintenance. And I don't mean, okay, I'm gonna pay your bills and all that, no, that, that too, but maintenance to stay and hold the path. And, and you know, we connected to a, a big, uh, since we joined as a family, we got a family like New York, Chicago, <laughs> it's like, and you know what? And our family looks for answers. And you gotta be able to give an answer. You can't just run up to Vermont and just hide. (laughs) Although this is where everybody's at. (laughs) I know y'all got family across the United States. Hey, let me ask my professor friend, my my professor cousin, he got money. So we, (laughs) real talk. 
Uh, there's so much you said in there, but I, I think what I want to... <laughs> I know. I, I I'll, also I'll, get criticized for being cryptic. That's, no, no, that's no, 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 no. I'm rolling that's, that's with you. That's the art in me, too. I'm ready to let, you know, um, I'm just trying to contain myself. Well, this is the uh, thing. This is the thing, yeah. uh, Carlos. My wife is very quick to say, Chuck, stop being cryptic. <laughs> I said, baby, crypt being cryptic protects me sometimes. <laughs> I write verses sometimes. You're like, I can really get cryptic. Anyway. I'm just <laughs> no, I mean... I, I think what's most significant about what you're sharing is the importance of the way in which we maintain an identity, but not as this singular idea, but the idea of identity within this notion of struggle and struggle towards a place where we can be liberated, right, from these, you know, spaces that we're stuck in. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to get into was family, and you, you touched on it a little bit, but to share with us, and Gay as well, just the... The, how important it's been to maintain this level of groundness, this spiritual component of authenticity. And as a, you know, within this union, Chuck, you traveling all over the world, you holding it down in the classroom. Share with us a little bit about those, those challenges and, and what's happening today in reference to why are we not cultivating longevity within union and as professionals? It in solidarity, you know what I mean? Where it's black and brown families lasting, you know, so. I, you can start this one off, because I, it's, really, yo, it's, you know, you gotta really seriously, mind, body, and soul gotta be on the same page, and really seriously, you, life is about with corporations, businesses, b American business, or whatever that's about, that crap is about, it's about quantity. How much? What's bigger? Get this. Got to have that. You know, with life, it's about quality. Every second of your life has to be at the highest of your energy to be able to get the quality. You got to struggle for that. You got to fight for that one. It's hard. Sometimes we have to look at it different ways, like, look, the five minutes that we have to have is quality, and that five minute breaks down mathematically into 60 seconds of quality seconds times five is five minutes. And, and if we looked into the quality of life instead of quantifying about, well, how much time can I get with you? It's like, how much time can you get me for what? The bullshit? <laughs> you almost got to also come up with, yo, this is zero time for bullshit if you're at the top of your family line. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be bullshit. Yeah, yeah, I'm the, I'm the youngest, and I'm really like, eh, and they're going to take care of me. And really, although I feel there's no time for that, just maybe there's time for that. But at you, if you're at the top and you're the accountable person trying to teach accountability and responsibility, you just have no other time. You got no other choice in these times. We don't have families that are all connected together with some of the like-minded where, okay, we can't get this done with our family, so the family next door, the family across the street, since we're all connected, you know, feel, even feel, if, if it's not even philosophically, we all at least know what e each other, we know what each other's doing. We're not really, our family is not just zoned into the like-minded of a device that we're able to FaceTime. You know, because the FaceTime and all that, it's great. It brings people from far distances close. But the physicality of, of, of what you got to do on the day-to-day, hour-to-hour, month-to-month, it takes a lot more. It's almost like it's another world that you got to kind of, like, fight to stay into, I think. I mean, I, it, you, that's an hour conversation, mm -hmm. I think, because the reality of it is telling people as we get further in towards 2020, which is supposed to be a, a clear vision, right? Mm -hmm. And no one seems to know what the fuck 2020 is going to look like. <laughs> very, very scary picture in 2020. Um, 2014 is about the struggle. It's like the pivot foot in basketball. Keeping your foot grounded and making sure everything else dips into those other different areas. That's basketball talk. But your foot got to be grounded and the reality, and reality is shrinking to many people. Right. The surroundings of reality is shrinking. 
fantasy, people living through their avatars, that's becoming the reality. So when it comes down to doing real things, like, you know, zoning into your child who's been taught to kind of create a shell. And it's understandable for children to have shells. But when the adult has the shell and can't break out of their introvertness, or if that's a, such a word, if the adult has a shell and they cannot communicate downward, that's part of the problem I think we're at today. And then I always challenge people. You know, you're 21. You can't talk to nobody 16? No, I can't. So don't you mad because nobody 28 talked to you, talked to you now, or when you were 16, nobody talked to you. So this cycle of what's happened in the last 20, 25 to 30 years is a vicious cycle where the, where the inside is cut out. So people felt like I haven't been communicated to. So I'm going to seek my communication, but not with a real person. I'm going to seek it whatever it's at but then you're building your individual shell. And when it comes down to parenting, mentorship, teaching, the burden is placed on teachers. Mm -hmm. The burden is placed on teachers while, while they're getting paid less and less. Professors are just like, oh, you know, like looked upon like they're supposed to do the job that the 10th grade teacher was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So it's exhausting because these teachers are taking surrogate roles as being the parent that the parent never was even when the parent was there so the parent just they couldn't crack through mm -hmm. these are different out, outer layers on individuals now and i just know that you know my wife works hard i mean she works so hard at teaching a classroom full of ungrateful <laughs> 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 well i'm not in her fields ungrateful motherfuckers. <laughs> Then a child, and then at the same time, we take, we take responsibility of being able to be kind of like the people that lead our families. Having parents in, in there. Don't think the government ain't gonna take care of your, 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 your senior citizen parents. Mm -hmm. hey, the government ain't gonna pay the mortgage on my father's, oh, he, you know, oh, well, you know. So you gotta like really hold it down. And that's the biggest difference. Can I say this as far as, a, um, of course I can say it, but I'm just saying, <laughs> black and brown families, Yes. seriously, we can't say, oh yeah, by, by matter of fact, my brother-in-law, he's a lawyer in, 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 um, in Evansville, Indiana, and, and then, you know, my, and my, my other cousin, he owns horses in Kentucky. We're not close, but they're there. We be looking in our family like, yo, has anybody here got a goddamn job? <laughs> Yeah, that's real talk. So all that, oh, Obama's president, and y'all done made it. Everybody in our family. You know, that, now, the reason I ask can I say it, because I don't want to say everybody in my family broke, but, <laughs> and then that's not even an issue. <laughs> See, I don't want the tape to be YouTube, and then my brother be like, yo, because my brother be working with me, too. It's like, yo, bro. But I'm just giving you, this is the reality of it. All this black people and brown people that make it, understand, when you see a black, see, some people out there, since so they, they famous, you know, when, if they ever go to their family reunion, when you see them at a family reunion with bodyguards, that ain't their family. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's just so-and-so. You got to go over the cousins, whatever. You got the bodyguards around. So that ain't, nah, that ain't what we do. You talk about when you see a black person make it, they're probably one out of 100 that probably has a profession, which is different from white America. But, oh, well, yeah, my, 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 my uncle used to own a, you know, a parts plant, and now his parts plant went under. Wow, well, he owned a parts plant. When you talk about ownership in this country, man, hello, family. So we have a vast accountability and responsibility just in our family blood and then we we'll talk about the extension into our communities it's the same thing so all this y'all you know, done made it y'all you know we all got a president it was like yo our family lines don't go i mean i mean we in the hotel and i'm looking at paintings of dudes it's like what this painting must be from 1791 man it's like damn i was like so it, and he's hanging here in 2014 in this damn hotel. We ain't got that. <laughs> and so that's, this is the reality that doesn't get across to white America. Like, yeah, there's been some steps 
and even when you get smacked back three steps and then you got the struggles and new, ge new generations come in and people say, oh, why don't they just, you know, just, just assimilate, you know, and you guys got integration and, you know, everything is all good. You start from there. My people came from, you know, you know Prussia in and, and, and 1897 and then I'm Austria, you know, we were broke too. All were together on the same boat. It's not the same story. It's not the same story. And you can get this across and academics understand, but they still go back to their families and say, oh, well, yeah. I heard something and learned something new tonight. Anyway, what's the corned beef? Ready? <laughs> but we go back to reality, and the reality is that new, new people are coming in, and new laws are being made, and rhetoric is over here that affects these people going into these places. The ratio in the prison industrial complex makes it racial the ratio. So, I mean, and being an artist, I was always taught that if you're going to talk to they talk to them, add a little bit in here, and, you know, y'all can laugh. I'm not half laughing, but I'm saying some things that are very real. That's where that Dick Gregory thing came from, but it's a very, we're in a crisis. We're, it's a big crisis. It's, it's a crisis. It's a crisis of not being able to still be able to embrace the human family. And our culture brings human beings together for our similarities and knocks aside the differences. That's why I, I call myself a culturalist. I'm a raptivist. I believe in human beings. I don't believe in governments. Give me, and you know what? And, and you know, governments, when governments are in charge of culture, it's a danger. Just like people saying when well, government's in charge of health care, you know, the whole thing with Obamacare, and I'm trying to also figure out how that works, and then the alternative, oh, yeah, we'll just get people together to get insurance. So what does this do for the person that can't, ain't, you know, try to get some whatever done? So there's, there's these quick fixes are never the answers, but governments have been pretty much contradictory to, to human existence on this planet, but that's a little bit too utopian. And I didn't know that the little people in there, so I take my two curses back. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rosa. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, did you want to uh, jump in? There? That's not I good. I think we got like 20 minutes left. I think we have like 20 minutes left. Yeah. That's not good. Pardon my long, pardon my long answer too. I'm that 54-year-old curmudgeon. He's 53. <laughs> I'm rolling with you. I just want you to know that. Um, Gay, it, uh, we're, we're, we're moving towards the end of the thing. And Gay, as you jump in, I just want to say real quick, I wanted to get into you know Obama up in the ante on the side of political prisoners. How do we uphold tradition, school to prison pipelines, day of standardized testing. But tune into Trigger Radio for that. All right, because we don't have enough time. We'll get into that. Hey, you know what? Tell, you know, we, we, we're going to get Trigger Radio on Rap Station with an app. Yeah, well, that, that was my last. That was going to be my that's, last that's question. That's going to make that Where we move now? Yeah, but that's beautiful. Yeah. But uh, um, y'all, yeah, y'all heard it first. <laughs> yes. But I get a lot. I, trust me. I mean, I I totally like. You know, it's all about a we. Well, my wife gives me a lot of advice, a lot of counsel. Make sure. Well, number one, make sure I ain't ashy. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps it real like that. Make sure you're prepared. Tell stories when you talk. Don't meander it, and make sure you ain't ashy. <laughs> and when I was on Arsenio, Arsenio, I was neat. I wasn't ashy, but I forgot the main thing when they say, well, public enemy, rock and roll hall of fame, what did it mean? And I didn't say, and it's killing me, because once again, it's, sp it's space de debris. So you could go online, oh, let me see Chuck D or Arsenio, and it's space debris. There's nothing you can do about it. It's already in orbit. It's, um, I meant to say the biggest thing, mm -hmm. the biggest thing that we tried to get across was the presentation of Mr. Harry Belafonte. And 
who's who really seriously really laid down the template, mm -hmm. really carried the torch from Paul Robeson. I was, I'm able to have a conversation with Harry Belafonte and get Paul Robeson. See, this is the whole key about, about history and a place that's so bad on history and geography. And you, if you don't have your history, you don't have the geography in order. I mean, you'll come up to, you know, up to Northampton with a, with a, with a, a small jacket, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go down to Northampton. <laughs> down from where? I'm gonna go down there from Austin, Texas. <laughs> so history and geography of the USA are some really poor on. So w what it boils down to is that you're not used to, and we talked about this, there's an agenda to scrape anybody that's over 40 years old, black or brown, off the face of television. So, uh, to sell popular culture. Popular culture is not meant to be sold. It's really meant to be learned and given away. The biggest mistakes while the record companies went down is that they're trying to sell music. You're supposed to get music. And before you get music, you're supposed to get music. And you get culture, then you get it. Whatever means, whatever you get it, because it's supposed to be an enhancement. And, and Harry Belafonte, the fact that he's still here, he's not 80-something years old. He's four 20-year-olds in an 80-something-year-old body. <laughs> and the fact that we had Harry Belafonte and Spike Lee, who actually, it was Spike Lee presenting us in motion pictures and film, which is a no-no, because -no, Spike Lee is a no-no in -no, pre presenting public. We never, Fight the Power wouldn't have been anything with it. Spike Lee didn't only put it in, do the right thing. He put it in. 700 times. <laughs> and so when you hear things like, well, Michelle and Barack, their first date was do the right thing, I don't need to have somebody ask me a dumbass question like, well, you think Barack will have public enemy in his iPod? I'm like, why would he? And why, you know, what do you think? He'll never ever say he had, because they just then he's not in that seat. <laughs> when the dude took that seat, that's what that seat gives. Expect, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting, I don't care. But you have to think beyond what's delivered to you. Other than that, Harry Belafonte and Spike Lee, that was what we wanted to get across. And usually the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, when they had their presentation, they have a pattern of having somebody younger introduce the older. We had, we had, we had an issue, we had a beef. Mm -hmm. Really, we ain't gonna have a beef with me too long. Yeah. Not really, cause I, you know, I'm like, wow. So let's make this happen. Got it to happen, and that was the highlight. And I think my wife could attest to that. That was the highlight of Public Enemy going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, is to be able to pay tribute to someone getting that television time to say something very important. And he was talking about families in prison. Mm -hmm. And to be able to take that and knowing that HBO is going to play it over and over and they dare not cut it out. Yeah, you can cut Flavor's speech. <laughs> Flavor done had a lot of TV time. <laughs> they know that the whole key, I think the key is you, can, you got to so be a stand-up person. And not to say that they had governing order over me, but make that person who gotta, uh, who's got to do something with you involved, make them think about before they make a, a, a hasty decision. Make them think like, oh, man, if we cut Harry Belafonte's speech, we got to deal with that Chuck D. Oh, no, let's not do that. And if everybody could have taken, if many could have taken that role in the arts and in hip-hop, many of the people, not, not just the fans of it, but the people within the working order and infrastructure would have been better off with hip hop being a leading gauntlet instead of being the Millennium COINTELPRO. Mm. So when people talk about Jay-Z, they talk about the Jay-Z or whoever, or Puffy or whatever, you know, did they do anything more hip than Harry Belafonte who got platinum in 1957? And Paul Robeson who ran over people at Rutgers and and, and was 
knew eight different languages and still able to spit? <laughs> mm -hmm. Nah, hell no. <laughs> and you got to start asking, and not even you, you got to start asking, this, this culture that I brought in, did I really think about what came in? And was it nourishment and did it make me feel good? Or did, was it fast food? Because mm -hmm. you hear people like, who's your favorite? Well, uh, Jay-Z. Name five Jay-Z records. Well, I don't know, but he's just my favorite. I'm like, <laughs> now I know why some things I like. I'm in the thing. But just don't be like, uh, you're conditioned like a robot to take it. Because you, you got to start asking a question. I took it in, and what did it do for me? Like I said, I took in Curtis Mayfield as a kid. My parents is playing them. They ain't playing them for me. But I picked up on them later, because at the end of the Curtis Mayfield record, I feel damn good. Now, you got to start asking yourself a question about who you listen to, who you watch, what thing you said. You know, maybe you're able to navigate through it. But at the end of the day, if you feel like you got a rusty donut in your soul, <laughs> 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 somebody done injected you with it instead of you picking it for yourself. I, that's I, real I, talk. That, that, that's, that's, I love that. Rusty donut in your soul. <laughs> I love that. So listen, I think we are at the end of time. We're going to try to get the questions in, but I want to gay. And thank you, Chuck. Until questions. Okay. So, um, okay. Um, well, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, we think, uh, coming back to this, question of freedom you know I think a lot of people like because we're we're taught this way they like to think of freedom as this continuous narrative it's always getting better and right now a lot of people are talking about this renaissance in black film right that there's all these black people now in Hollywood and you know of course many of us are skeptical about that because there's never been a time when we've been elevated to that kind of level when it's been really about us. And when you think about uh, things historically and you kind of think about this in the counter, I mean, it's a counter narrative sort of, I guess. And you think about that moment that I was talking about earlier in 1865, right? People think, oh, this freedom thing, this came. And, you know, really it was just the transformation of the world economy was why slaves were freed. It wasn't because, and it's the same thing with anything else. Why, you know, why um, Mexican farm workers are granted certain kinds of, of uh, um, uh, freedoms is not just because people all of a sudden grew a conscience. It's number one, it's because people were getting knocked in the head in the fields because they were protesting and they were demanding these things. But another thing is because there were transformations of, of economic processes that allowed corporations to give a little bit because they knew that their win was long term, not short. So when I hear people talk about this renaissance in black film, I feel like in a way it's sort of the ultimate um, trick because it's not just because I, I feel like you know they must be up to something or, but because I'm thinking I think logically and also feeling intuitively that there's never been a moment where something like this has happened and it's been about us but also for us so I don't I don't trust it because not because I I'm just you know um, cultivated not to trust but because I also feel like it, there's a transformation of the economy that's happening right now that makes it very important for black people, brown people, to believe that because we see ourselves represented more frequently on television, that we've somehow arrived at this moment of equity. So when I, it disturbs me, in terms of your question about family, that I have to steer my child away from all of the representations of black women on television because the only ones she can really see are on reality television and all of those women are only kicking each other's asses all the time and tearing each other down. It's horrifying. So I, I can't, I, 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 when I, of course I see more black and brown people on television. Of course I see more working class people on television, but what are they doing? And how are they speaking to one another? And there's no sense anymore of this sense of, you know, I think um, 
uh, family accountability when it comes to respect and listening, it's true that, I mean, people don't know how to listen anymore. Just listen, just, just be present here, please, just be here. It doesn't matter if you feel like there's something more exciting happening on you know, Instagram, it doesn't matter because there's nothing more important. You're never gonna get this moment here. And there was something that maybe I think has never has hasn't been explicitly stated, and maybe some of it was fear because in past generations, if you were disrespectful, I mean, really one of the number one re ways to be disrespectful was to appear to be distracted when your elder was talking to you. You know, so I'm not waxing nostalgic about other times, but what I'm saying is that this transformation of the world economy, I think, has made it so that. That now, if 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 I mean, I think better than ever, people have been convinced that you know because we're represented, that we now have some kind of at least equal platform. But the 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 thing that's amazing is that at the same time, the tolerance for diverse kinds of expressions is also closing. So there's a lot of times we'll talk about how complicated it is for those of us who have something serious to say to serious people, when we get finally that moment to say something, no wonder it's complicated because we never have that time, you know? So you never know what's going to come out. And, it's, and if you're awkward about it and you don't know exactly how to, how to express yourself, but you have so much built up inside you, good things that you want to say about your people or your experience, but it's awkward. And you don't, but you never have another moment because you really only get that one time because it's never for you, but it's about you. It's always about you. Our friend Robin Kelly is, has written in this incredible book, did on um, fighting the culture wars in, in the US, he says, you know, what is it about young black men that makes us also terrified of them, but makes us want to wear their shoes? You know, so like, again, it's not a it's not for us, but it's always about us. And one of the things we have problems with that on my campus, and I know many places have this camp this problem on their campuses too, is again, you know, the I mean, the, the growing the, the the segregation is growing so much in the United States that it's really probable that if you're a white kid, that you'll go to school with mostly white kids. But again, it's that love and theft at the same time. So you come to a place where you really want to, you want to, you want to, you have respect, genuine respect for the source. You know, it's like you always say, you know, hip hop, yeah, it's everybody's music, but respect the source, right? Respect the source. And so you have genuine liberal respect for the source, but it makes you want to be, you know, and, and, and I think, Part of, this is part of this this whole thing that's going on right now with popular culture and the idea that there's a black renaissance in some way of culture. It makes you feel like you actually have some entitlement to dress up like it, to speak like it, to be it for the moment, you know. And then, and then, um, and and yet, you know, in many ways, that's the height of disrespect. So when you're talking about family, I mean, this is my roundabout way of saying, you know, I think as a woman is very, very disheartening to think about what kinds of, of images and, and what kinds of knowledge that my daughter is exposed to um, in the popular sense. But coming back, you know, thinking about, and again, in the question of womanhood, um, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking to see what um, has happened because of the economy, because of prisons, because of the, the because of the hatred that people have for, for the love that has been in, in, in families who have struggled historically. It's very heartbreaking to see what this has done to girls, um, boys too, but as a woman, I think about this all the time because I also think about how uh, difficult it is. It is difficult to be a woman and a professional, and um, to be partnered is not easy. It's jo a joy, but it's also, it's also, <laughs> it's also not. It's also it's work. It's work, and and and. But it's also it's duty. And I think that a lot of times too we get, and this is what I really appreciate about your question because I feel like implicit in it is a respect for all kinds of families. So that we're, we're here, here we are an, a, an example, but we almost don't wanna be that example of a man and a woman, you know, with a child and three children because he has two daughters previously. And we, we you know, we, 
we also have so much respect for the women who make these choices that say, I got to raise my four kids by myself and I'm going to have to do whatever I got to do to survive. That's a family right there. That's some strength and some tenacity and some integrity to do that. So, I mean, I think we are, we, we've learned to be, um, to, to have respect for that because we're surrounded by people who are struggling all the time. And we, we're, I think we're very blessed to have that in some ways, even though it is kind of, it can be drama sometimes, but it's still also, you know, it, we're blessed by it because it keeps our collective experience humble. When I first met Chuck's family, I remember his sister was telling me, ain't no Chuck D up in here, it's Chuck. I tell you every day, it's Chuck. Chuck, come here. And it's just so Chuck, shut up. Chuck. And I've seen her, I've seen and she she's she is something else. She is really something else. She has got all the whole family on lock, really. She's really got her she has her own mind. And she she was right. I mean, I have seen her chase him through the house. He, I don't want to hear any more of that, Lisa. Yeah, well, you go here now. So, and, and and you know, but these are our families, right? Who we love and who are annoying us, who are whatever, but it's because they don't they don't accept anything but duty, integrity, especially our fathers and our mothers. And let me not take out that garbage on Tuesday night. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but, well, I figure, you know, again, you know, as a woman, I mean, you, you, we know it's 21st century, right? I mean, and, and we, we know so much about our respective fields and we, and yet, you know, the, 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 the childhood thing, I mean, the child care and all of those things as a woman, as a professional, it's not equal. It is not equal. And, it's, and, it, and there's so many structures in place that keep it unequal, even when you have a partner who wants to help you and be that. There are so many ways in which everything is sort of working against you. And it is hard. I mean, it is, it is hard. But I think, again, you know, it comes back to what structure do we emerge from and who are the people that we are in conversation with and whose houses do we eat at, you know, and what, what, how do, what do we fill our minds, our bodies, our hearts with that allow us to constantly be in conversation that creates a, a sense of collective accountability mm -hmm. that allows us to say, all right, I have a duty, I have some integrity, I have some sacrifices I have to make. And, and, and it's not easy, but at least we've seen those people that we admire, we respect, that we love, we, that they do that and brings us into community. And so that's, I think, also the problem with fame, which I think that, that Chuck has done. I, I, don't, I don't know anybody who's done a better job with saying, I refuse. I mean, I'm famous, but I refuse to be famous in many respects because I have a duty. I have, I have integrity. I have sacrifices I have to make. Beautiful. Oh, yes, thank you so much. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I can't convey enough uh, the honor that I've had to, to sit up here and, and to just be a part of this process. And even deeper, my, my daughter's here as well. And what better way of me trying to share with her the real work than for her to be here to hear this and for the folks that I love Alicia is here as well the young folks you know the people who are a part of my community and the Smith community that I've been privileged to be a part of as well and the way that I've been able to grow through these experiences and uh I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd be in a space where I would feel so good about the possibilities and so aggressive about love and so committed to social change. So we're gonna open it up for questions and before we do, I wanna I want do a quick, I'm gonna call this the rec moment. It's just, a, I'm gonna give you a word, five words. Just give me a one word response, just kinda something that comes to your mind. It's a way we're gonna just close out this little session. And uh, then we have two mics right here. And you know, as folks can kinda quietly prepare to, to ask a question and I've been informed not to ask the iPod question. If anybody says what's on your iPod, the fellas that are here that you can't see, and the females too, there's females that will escort you out. So don't, no, I'm only kidding. That wasn't that funny. That, that's, all right, so here we go. People are like, dude, just move on. Okay. Love. 
Are you gonna answer that first? No, oh, go ahead. I'm never good at the one word thing because I get too often. One word, Chuck. We got one word. Um, There's ten uh, one words word, for you. Um, love. Life. Spirituality. Art. <laughs> Life. Success. Quality. Perspective. And lastly, tradition. Memory. Memory. That's dope. <laughs> uh, I don't want to say legacy. Tradition, commitment. No doubt. Thank you both. Okay, so we're going to get started with the questions uh, in the interest of time. Again, uh, we have Jen, uh, 20 minutes, I mean half an hour for questions, half hour for questions. And if you are exiting, can we try to do it and respect the folks that are still here? Uh, we really appreciate you all being here tonight. Thank you. So first question, sir. Uh, my name is Carl Dix. been a revolutionary for four decades. So I was a little bit before Chuck, yes. but his work nurtured my revolutionary spirit. I want to go back to something that Dr. Gay said right at the beginning about the age of, in, of equality where black and Latino people in particular ain't coming out equal. And I want to end up on fight to power. Because, see, here's the deal. You got the equality of opportunity but tens of millions of black and Latino people are living lives enmeshed in the criminal justice system of this country. The folks in prison, the five million folks who used to be in prison and get discriminated against because they used to be in prison, and then all the loved ones of those people. Because you put a brother or sister in jail, then kids' lives are around jail, mom's life is around jail. All of that is coming together. And in fact, that's why Cornell West and I have proposed the month of resistance to mass incarceration in October. Y'all got my statement which speaks to that, to talk to me afterward, because the five colleges up here need to be part of that month. How it gets up to fight the power is to me, you gotta stand up, raise your sights to fight the power. And if you raise your sights, then you can change yourself because you begin to see it ain't my fault. I didn't take the jobs away. Like the sister said, the developments in the economy, those jobs disappeared, the education system got wrecked, and what was out there. So to me, that all comes together, and I guess it's not really a question, but it might be something y'all want to bounce off of in terms of how Fight the Power comes together with that understanding of the age of equality, but an economy developing that is cutting the ground out from under folks. So I'm just going to stop there. And uh, well, well, you never, you never stop calling. You shouldn't no, stop. No, I'm going to take Please. a break. And <laughs> 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 I might want to talk to you afterward, Chuck, because... As we do, man. And I'm, I'm very glad I'm, I'm seeing you. Carl, also, um, we were, when, I had, when I was on radio a lot in New York, we, wherever we could to convene to try to get the point across, it's not about even asking Carl questions. It's about letting Carl be able to get across what he's got to get across because it's for the freedom of human beings. No doubt. Yeah, so thank you, Carl. Thank you. I have like 10 questions, but I'm gonna just narrow it down to one. That was Thank you. incredibly rich. But um, I guess my main question um, would be, um, Gay, you said that you, uh, one thing that disturbed you 
most about um, watching TV and seeing the representations of black women on TV was kind of this monolithic representation, which I find um, not only with just women, but with blackness in general. And it really disturbs me. And I have a young daughter who I'm trying to raise, and so I try to create, um, I guess, more variety of blackness for her to see representations of herself. But um, Chuck, my question is, is more geared towards you because I actually, I actually like pop culture um, in addition to uh, academia and, and lots of other things. I find that pop culture is, is entertaining um, and it can be useful and a lot of people are engaged in it. And you you know, we're a part of a revolution, but you were also a part of pop culture. And I find that, um, you know, I've written a lot of things for um, my daughter, and I've, you know, tried to break into the world of writing, and there are obstacles so that this monolithic representation can, can be maintained. And so I'm curious about, um, I guess, ways of, of, of fighting the power so that we can see a broader view and, and uh, more perspective on ourselves and how not to give up, you know, how to be successful in that industry and not, you know, fight or bleep your way, you know, to success. And so. Um, I was raised as an art student, so that was a little different. I graduated from college as an art student. I had to learn about art. And I know art is subjective, but art becomes subjective when you start to learn about it and the history of art and expression. And I don't mean just in a, in a set Western academic way, but you start to really understand that it's the expression of, of, of your inner side. Once your expression gets, gets dictated and, and it's tied to something that you got to sell and it's based on a contract, and then people say, well, you gobble it up because this is what I'm taught to do. It's no different than fast food. A lot of people like McDonald's but don't know why. Um, the same thing when people say they love popular culture. Pop, they love it because they don't know why because it's just always presented to them. So I just say, tell people all the time, when you say you love something, most people in these times can't define what they love. And when it comes down to art, which is short for artificial, which is a reflection and a facsimile of life instead of life itself. It turns into this, this whole other thing. So I just think that if we had school systems that was able to teach art, and I'm not saying you're going to have a, a good art versus bad art, but I do believe that there's a level of thorough art expression as high art versus low art that, that actually can make a lot of people understand it before they happen to say, I'm satisfied by it. And that's the whole argument between food you grow, GMOs, and fast food. <laughs> so, and you probably won't get people to stop going to Burger King and McDonald's ever. But I'm saying that when it comes down to culture, communities have to teach culture because when you're dealing with cultures, uh, communities of color especially, or inner communities, our history and our everything is embedded into our culture, especially music. You strip music away, music history, there's the history and the people of music away from the people, then you have them fending for culture and fending for history when it's already in the music. And that was one of the first agendas in the 60s, strip the culture away from the people Strip the DJs on the radio from saying anything, connecting them with the community, give them soulless, mindless stuff, and therefore you have people still fending around trying to search for themselves when it was all in the music in the first place. And when you talk about the elements of hip hop, there ain't nothing new. With DJ and MC and breakdance and graffiti, there's still what? Musicianship, vocalization. Uh, um, graphic detail going back to the hieroglyphics to dance culture. It's the same thing. But if you strip people and redefine something and call it, well, we're Hot 97, the home of hip hop and R&B. The nerve, <laughs> right? And nobody seems to know what hip hop is. Nobody has a definition for hip hop and they don't have a definition for R&B and they don't have a definition for rap music. But they, I dig it. I love it. For what? Why, why, why you love what you love? I don't know. Eventually, I don't know, turns into. Mm. 
<laughs> and you're back in the, that caveman thing where you could be sold anything. And right now, popular culture is making people by themselves. <laughs> It's like, I'm looking for myself, so I'm going to go into popular culture so I could go out and spend what I ain't got to find myself. <laughs> Selfies. <laughs> Yo, I mean, how many people got a cell phone? Now, if I had the almighty power, and those not raised, how many people got a cell phone? <laughs> That's like asking, how many people got a passport? Well, everybody up here got one. <laughs> you got a cell phone. If I had the almighty power to cut your cell phone off, there'd be some mad people in here that wouldn't be tackled by those people you talk about. <laughs> I'm not. But I'm just saying that the people in popular culture have now been pied pipered in the popular culture. Look, our daughter's two years old. We don't know what, uh, why is she compelled to dress like a black woman out of the 50s? <laughs> I, right? Yo, I ain't got no style. And my wife chooses to, you know, downplay oh, I don't. style, right? She, no, 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 I downplay, yeah. But no, she changes her clothes three or four times a she day. Looks she like likes she's dresses and hats and... Hats, the whole, like, like 1958, you know? <laughs> I'm like, what, you know, so... What's going to actually be, what's, what's actually trying to sell her how she should look in the period from 2 to 18 to 20? Something's going to be in there trying to buy your family to go out there so you can buy your family back. People don't have, they're paying mental rent to corporate presidents. Where you got to go out and look for yourself but not only look for yourself, when you find yourself, you better have some money to get yourself back. And, the, <laughs> and what you get back, be sorry, be careful what you ask for. So people, I think people in, in from all the way up to 40 years old, they think they gotta be this in order just to exist here. One of the first things I did when I got me a passport, get the hell up out of here. Now this public enemy, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It ain't happen because we, we Americans' favorite. Get the hell out of here. And I'm not saying any government is better. All governments are whatever they are. But my thing is, like, it's a damn shame that we got to ask a government to get permission to visit the planet Earth like we some aliens. <laughs> and as long... And as long as human beings got to get permission to visit the planet Earth, no government is going to be right. So I don't know how they're going to figure that out. I'm not an economist. I'm not, you know, I'm not a politician. But all I know, as long as that happened, it ain't never going to get better. So the minute I was able to get a passport, I was able to get out of here. I never, I, in the so-called third world, right? If it wasn't for the Nation of Islam, I wouldn't have been able to go to places that weren't on the map to go and spread hip-hop music all places in Africa, South America, all those places that are off the map, or off the allied map, <laughs> of USAers. I tell people, it's like, they, they quantify things wrong. Oh, man, so you ain't popping now. I played in front of 100,000 people in Bogota three months ago. They don't count? Well, they just South Americans. They don't count. I played in front of 100,000 people in Accra, Ghana. They don't count? Well, that's over there. I hear a USA or talk about overseas. Over what sea? There's an ocean. Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Once again, history and geography. <laughs> when it's carved away from your average USA, -er, right? You're going to have a problem you can't fix. You know, the call. Carl Dix explains and he lays it out simple and plain how to even be able to process some things. Revolution is it's, it's not an event. It's a process, like Professor Griff says. It's a process. But also we're in times with these blizzard and whippings of mass distraction. You got to figure out how to adapt and reinvent yourself. And I don't know in the time frame that you got to do it. Maybe three times a year. Maybe twice a year. We have to kind of, you know, the things that come at us in, in my wife's profession and in my profession, we got to reinvent ourselves and then get together and see if we're on the same page and raise a child. 
who's dressing like Rosa Parks. <laughs> oh. I, Yo, I mean, really. Serious. You gotta be able to look at Mary Poppins and, and get the most out of Mary Poppins as opposed to drunken love. Yeah. Yo, that's real talk. Now, I don't know how Jay-Z and Beyonce raised their child. But, I mean, nah. I mean, it's, it's like... Uh, yeah, like, my wife told you about my sister, right? <laughs> She's gonna be the first one if, if, if things is off track. <laughs> Can I say, as a, as a mother, though, um, we were talking about this earlier, Jen, J Jennifer was reminding me of something I had said to her about how, you know, it's an interesting moment for me, like I've been working really hard to finish my book, and then it's like I finished my book, I got tenure, and then I got a contract in another place, and I was so excited, right? I got, I, and I, I was thinking, and then I'll, okay, then you, you, you know, you get your book out, and then, then the, the speaking um, invitations start rolling in, right? And I was telling her, this is an interesting moment, though, because we, in many ways, as academics, we work towards this moment, right? But then I had my child, right? So, and she's going to be three in May, and so I have to say no to a lot of stuff that, for all my academic career, I've been told that's the shit you want to say yes to. Like, they called, yes, <laughs> say yes, doesn't matter what. But wait a minute, I got to bring, we, our child's at the hotel right now, and because we have a feminist host, we have feminist hosts who know, oh, well, you know, if we're going to bring them, we got to bring some childcare too, and we need to have, so this is about, you know, also understanding too that, it's like my, my, my comadre says, you know what, they, they, the, your kids, you know, you think they distract you from the work, but they are the work, and they're the best kind of work, right? So what I'm saying is that, like, what I had to realize in that moment, and it's hard to say no sometimes, to, because you, oh my God, I always respected that person, and they sent me this email, and asked me if I would come and speak, oh my God, gotta say no, can't do it, because can't travel that day or whatever. I realized that, that all that, and it was a hard pill to swallow, but like with your writing, it's so important, so important. And how amazing is it that your daughter knows that you write? I mean, if you never share it with anybody but her, if it never gets on Scandal or wherever, she knows that like that book or that, that, that sitcom or whatever you write, it was always in you. And that was a thing that I think I had to realize. And I think that you help everyone to realize too, is that if you're an artist, you're a writer, you're whatever, it's always in here. And, and as He's told me many times, it's like, this is the thing artist partners don't understand about artists, is that if we're gonna die if we can't get this stuff out of us, right? The, what does that mean? I mean, it means too sometimes that then you realize like that the, the reward isn't so much, okay, where is it gonna appear? Who's gonna ask me to come? But that my daughter knows I'm a writer and, and I can share with her, I can talk with her, I can tell, check this out, listen, even when she doesn't wanna hear it no more, you know? But it's like always been, and, and, and the thing that, our daughters are going to say about us is not where did she speak or where did her work get on television, but my mother was a writer. Mm -hmm. She was a writer, and, and I can do that too, you know? So. Wow. Uh, before the next question, I also would like to give some props to Rosa Clemente because I remember right when you were having your children, and it was like, you know, and you was juggling like 60 hours a day. <laughs> and still running for vice president in the Green Party. It's like, you know, so uh, much of the time my wife tells me, it's like, you know, that there's this always this imbalance. Well, what women have to do just to be able to just elevate and in the, in the fact that it's like the, the collective absence of black males and males of color is the tragedy of, of, of just being there to help step up. We can't even come halfway as far as the burden. We'd be like, I'd be like looking like, okay, what can I do? I'm like, <laughs> but just that, you know, the fact that, that hip hop has tossed women down a virtual flight of steps and been like, yeah, what? And then everybody says, well, you know, look, uh, you know, Nicki Minaj, she's the Obama of women in hip hop. <laughs> Be happy with her. She's making all this. It's like, wow. It's like, is that, and it is silenced. Groups have been silenced in hip hop, which is the first tragedy. Well, really, women have been silenced. That's the, that's the first tragedy. The next tragedy is groups, collectives. Because when groups started, and this was a lawyer thing, 
lawyers said it's very easy to renegotiate with, a, with one person than deal with four. In rap, it's called re-nigger-gotiating <laughs> or re-negotiating. And so they can extract the group and take the one person and take the DNA of that one person and just go ahead and make that and define and redefine. And, and in their alliances, which was another cancerous decision in hip hop, Bill Clinton's 1996 Telecommunications Act, which destroyed regional and local hip hop all over the map for being able to be played on its local signals and local businesses and local record stores, coupled with the control centers from LA and New York, Mashed, mashed up together with the East Coast, West Coast farce, which was really LA, New York businesses, which culminated in 97 with the deaths of Tupac and Biggie as martyrs, which also culminated as hip hop taking another drive into commercialism with the acceptance of what Def Jam and Bad Boy and Death Row were doing, and they were put in positions. It makes one Wonder did the climate of corporations create, uh, did the corporations create the climate for hip hop being the new COINTELPRO or the one stop shop for the prison industrial complex, which now private situations, you know, might in a, by the year 2020, if you don't watch it, your favorite whatever's left multimedia company or Viacom or a Def Jam could actually be putting khakis or owning a prison up at Comstock or Coxsackie or Plattsburgh or Greenhaven and say, wow, who owns part of this? Oh yeah, it's put together by Def Jam. Because they create the climate, strip the education, have somebody follow the breadcrumbs and by 18 years old, put him right back in there. And who knows, by 2025, give him his first job. Pressing up smartphones. Stranger, was, you know, truth is stranger, in fact, is stranger than fiction. And when you have the ability to manipulate minds, bodies, and souls, then you can make fact fiction and fiction fact. And you turn up into down, make winter into summer and hot into cold and cold into hot because there's a blur between fantasy and reality. And most people want to dip into the fantasy world to get away from the reality they can't stand anyway, such as somebody selling you a bottle of Ciroc, so leave your reality and get yourself vodka out. Or well, that's how the drug game became big, although it's dried up into the, into the streets somewhat for poorer people in the area of pharmaceuticals and all that, it's reared its ugly head bigger than life. So all this has come to pass on the saying the cheapest price is to pay attention. And I don't, I'm not a believer of people that, oh man, all they do is talk, all they do is talk, they don't come up with some solution. You gotta pay attention to everything. And this misinformation age, is, and like I said, it's like fish. Eat what you can, Make sure you don't choke on the bones. And that goes with choosing who you want to be, somebody who's the head of your school board, political leader, government, whatever. You just got to make sure you don't choke on the bones. And these bones are very <laughs> little. They'll slide down your throat and make you cough because you, you didn't see it or taste it coming. That's just my point of view. A nerve, a nerve of a rapper to have a point of view. That was what Public Enemy was about when he first came. It was a nerve of y'all to come up with that. Like, y'all, we ain't supposed to speak. Even at our most controversial, it was like the nerve of y'all to have a conversation about Israel and Palestine. Like, the nerve, we can't have it. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what most people are used to hearing and seeing culture talk about today, which is nothing. And I'm not beefing about it, but it's what it is. Yes. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about how do you feel about your success or achievements in life? Right, what's your name? Brendan. It's a great question, a really great question. I felt that the, the thing that I, my personal success, um, 
is to be able to contribute to human beings called my children that have their own sense of mind. Be human beings that's able to teach, but also personal. I don't think the, um, the six years I spent on a four year degree <laughs> can never be taken away from me. And that same school gave me an honorary, honorary doctorate. But they gave me an honorary doctorate because it was an honorary doctorate in the arts. So I really felt the degree I got in the arts in 1984, I was able to like give to the world. And um, that's what I think you should do with education. You can't keep education for yourself. The more people that pay for your education or you get it, you're supposed to get it out of you as quick as possible. And for we talk about our family. A lot of our families are not, you know, are not educated to the level that we got the education. Doesn't mean it's a brag. It ain't a bragging point. It ain't a bragging point. You get it and you give it. You got to give it all away. Get it out of you. For you know, what I learned in my days, I gave it all away for free. I gave it all to my friends for free. What I learned, and trust me, when they went to college too, I tried to get it out of them for free. And I just think education, you can't, you can't give everybody, everybody a dollar in this room, but we could give them some knowledge based on your experience or what you know, and you could give everybody that just with a microphone. So I thought that was something that I considered um, to be a success or to go around many corners of the world and somebody come in to me and say, thank you. They're not thanking me because of something I physically gave them or gave them money. They're thanking me for something that touched themselves to inspire themselves about themselves. And I think that's the important thing about artists. Can you actually touch somebody so they can look within themselves and feel like, wow, I'm inspired. I got great perspective and I know what to do with, with, with what I got out of that. So. Can I give out my email address real quick? It's chuckd at publicenemy.com. If you don't remember that, you don't need to have it. <laughs> and uh, you could tweet me. I only do one social network. Uh, it's at Mr. Chuck D, and that's um, on Twitter. I'm not a Twittyet. And in the times where more people on Facebook instead of their face in the book, I don't do that. It just kind of carries over to that. But um, I just do Twitter. So, um, and this, I'm not trying to cut you off because I know you've been patient, right, you know, but a uh, suggestion, maybe because of the time, if we can maybe stack a few questions, that's what y'all were kind of saying, to get a bunch of questions in, or we don't really have a lot of time and we will be kind of cooling out after, right, but, you know, this is all about the folks that are here filming and everything, so we can't uh, so, go too So let over. everybody ask their questions before. Uh, well, I don't know how many people there are, but I was thinking, was you know, this was a suggestion, and, you know, I'm just trying to roll. You know, I'm a team player. So I don't... There's two over there, too. Okay, well, let's just... Let's just. Uh, all right, after I ask my question, I'll sit down. Although it is actually two, but one of them is a yes or no. Um, Carlos, do you have a minute afterwards? I'd like to just talk to you. Uh, no. Uh, okay, good, good. Next question. No, I'm only playing, man. I'm only playing. I'm here. Uh, but I'm just, that's what you were saying earlier. I have a hard time saying no. <laughs> no, but it's all love, man. I'm, I'm, I'm good, yeah. Uh, and the other one, uh, it kind of goes back to sort of where you started off with. Um, what do you think is missing? Because I've been involved with like radical grassroots stuff. I'm actually in this guerrilla library. Uh, it's called Library F uh, Biblioteca 451. And, uh, you know, what do you think is missing with like the grassroots organizations that we see today that we had back in like the 60s and 70s? Like, what's different? I don't mean because the FBI arrested a whole bunch of Panthers. I mean, like, what are we missing today? Thank you. Uh, I, I actually think part of what's missing is just um, a, a general kind of societal recognition of the work that people are doing because the work is still being done. And I think that just because it doesn't get covered on CNN or USA Today or NPR doesn't mean that people aren't struggling every day to and, and you know you talk about libraries i know exactly exactly what you were doing but you know you could get thrown in solitary confinement for owning a copy of the autobiography of malcolm x or you know or or something that may not even appear to be that radical i mean those things are work they're important to be done and i think 
one of the things that's that that's missing now is that um, we don't do enough homework on our own. Those people who claim to be all about grassroots and whatever, name five grassroots organizations. Name five struggles around the city that you're in. You should know the city you live in. You should know what's going on around you. Who's coming? Who's cleaning up this room after you leave? I mean, we need to know what are the work conditions like in in the colleges that we study in. Those kinds of we need to know and make it your business, right? And and I think that that so in many ways, I mean, it's kind of like with teachers who are always getting a bad rap, you know. I actually think that it right now it's harder to do that work. So it's really I think about us trying to 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 raise it up and do and and help it to do what it it the dream you know that that they have, yeah. So I don't know that there's I mean of course. I've, we've worked with a lot of, I mean, I, I work with non-profit organizations and a lot of grassroots stuff. And everybody, we all got our, I mean, we some dysfunctional folks, all of us. We, I mean, especially when you get into struggle like that, people disagree and they don't have no problems letting you know, no, we ain't going that route. But this is another thing I think that's missing. You know, I tell my students about that moment in like 1905, 1907, when Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois were duking it out in the public. But you know what? They were having a conversation. And at least they were talking. You know, when Bill Cosby starts talking, somebody needs to answer him, right? <laughs> somebody needs to answer him and stop being so afraid just because we, we respect him and, oh, he was great. You know, like you talk about bobbing and weaving. It's like, yeah. why isn't somebody saying, yo, you can't say that about your people. You can't say that about us. And, and then th not that let that be the end of the conversation. I think that's one thing that's missing, too, is people are scary about having these public conversations. But yeah, grassroots work is messy, messy, messy work. And it always has been. But you know, these, these very cleaned up narratives about what has happened in the 1960s, a lot of that was ugly, too, really ugly. But they kept going. I mean, that was the, the thing. And they, they had these arguments and they they had the discourse and I think I think people need to stop being afraid yeah oh, thank you <laughs> oh my god that guy um uh, hi my name is Frank I'm uh, from Springfield Mass uh, my question is for Chuck um, how do you see the relationship between social activism and hip-hop developing over the next 10 years number one I mean the, the arts and the culture always needs great curators and these smart people and what I mean by smart people, people that have a concern and a care about all those other details about the arts and the culture and figure out how do you get it across and teach people about it. I'm a music, musicologist, so I don't see a separation between Nas and the Loving Spoonful. You know what I'm saying? And when somebody comes across like, yo, I'm a hip hop journalist. When do you start? I started in 2001. And I don't, I see a difference between Nas and, the, and who? <laughs> so, it, it, you know, music is music and you gotta get into the, th the thing of sometimes when people get judgmental based on their own personal, and this is a problem, your own personal feel. And everybody got their personal feel just like they got their own plate of food. Their own plate of food, they are gonna put on what they got on their plate and somebody gonna put on what they got on their plate. And so therefore, when you start saying your plate is better than somebody else's plate of food, it gets into this crazy semantics that don't make any sense. But I would tell you that when somebody says a good song is a good song, you got curated people, they're not curators, judgment calls on based on its value to sell it to somebody, that a good song can't just be something great about the lyrics that you can write down and read to yourself every day. I mean, the rest of development, people every day, that's just not a song, it's a prayer. You know, words and prayers, things that you could just read the words and carry a day. A song is no different, especially a song that means something. So if you want to design a song just so make how it makes you dance or how it makes you move, you're one-dimensionalizing a great culture and an art form. And I just think that the social activists who are in real life doing real things that say that they love the music. We need people in all facets of the art form to fight, curate, and uphold the art form, and then be able to make clear and concise ju judgment calls on the artistic brilliance of these songs, even if it sounds like something else, even if it comes out like Farrell Monch, Bad MF. 
which is my favorite theme song of the year. <laughs> and he's talking about songs, something within the deep frame of Bad MF that just rings to me and gives me courage and also speaks of mental illness and overcoming that. So we need people who are able to curate and overstand the beauty of words and music. And that's why I tell people, spread the words, because rap music's advantage and why it grew out of the box so strong is the fact that it was able to use, have a great use of words with or without the music to make somebody look into themselves and say, yeah, I get it. You didn't just sing a note and stretch a note that went over six or seven bars on one note. Rap was very concise. And those in the beginning that had the greatest vocabulary and sense of wit and being became your great rappers like Kool Mo D and Melly Mel. I mean, with, there was no accident. So somebody actually, that they could grunt their way and people say they're the best, well, maybe to do this or that, but we need great thinkers behind the arts and great thinkers that uphold the arts of rap, of rap music and hip hop and to be able to be at its most balanced and best from many different people instead of just one dimensionally coming through Viacom or the home of hip hop and R&B. <laughs> um, we have enough time for two questions. I know there's folks, I, I'm not sure, I think we might hang around for a minute afterwards, so I would encourage y'all to you know, connect. And if you are directing a question at Gay, she will be here tomorrow as well, given her lecture, so I would also encourage you all to, to come. So, Hi. Um, I just have two observations real quick. Your voice has not changed, Chuck D. Um, and I think that as far as the reflection of the black and brown experience, this space would not be what it is without the children here, and I think it's really beautiful. Um, okay, so I'm Frida. I was, I'm part of the Ada Comstock Scholars Program, which is a non-traditional program for students here. And um, three years ago, I could have never pictured myself in this space, right? And I think what's carried me here is these moments of affirmations, like you're doing what, this is right where you're supposed to be. And so I think that this moment is reflective of that. And so I thank you for your message. Um, but for me, like learning was, what did it, I don't wanna get emotional. That's it's us like too, my nerves. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what it too. is. So yeah. chill out. Okay, hold on. All right, so what, what the moment for me was like Frederick Douglass's autobiography and the way he taught himself how to read and write by tracing his fingers over the ships in the shipyard. And I remember for me, like, oh my God, like literacy that empowered him in that way. And I remember being, I was in community college, African American literature course, and it changed my whole trajectory of my education, everything. So I'm just curious to know what the song was, Professor Johnson, that changed your trajectory. Oh. That just that gives me chills to hear what you said. It was uh, Brother John by the Wild Chapatulas. Mm. Neville Brothers. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. We we take that with us everywhere. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's a beautiful night. Last question. I'm I'm really sorry, y'all. Just you know, I'm trying to also respect the folks that are putting in that work. So last question. Hi, um, I come from a school in Amherst that um, has like one fourth of, actually I have two questions and they're both for you and you can choose whether or not you wanna answer. Uh, no, no come that's, on, my right, come on. that's my homegirl, that's my homegirl, I'm sorry. Okay, um, so I come from a school where only one fourth of our Latinos go, go to college and you know, only 3% of our honor students are black and so not only are we literally kicking them out through like suspension and stuff, but that they're not engaged and I think a lot of that has to do with the curriculum, has nothing to do with us, we're never learning about us and you talked, Dr. Gay, you talked a lot about like, how you never had, like how classroom and home culture had been two very different like uni universes, you know? Um, and so I was wondering how you thought that hip hop implemented in, if you thought hip hop implemented in curriculum could nature more positive racial identities. Um, and like, cause I don't know, I just feel like personally as a woman of color, I have a lot more in common with like, and a lot more to learn with, from 
Amiri Baraka and like, you know, Lauren Hill than I do from like Shakespeare. You know, no offense to Shakespeare, but it's like, <laughs> you know, you know, you feel me? So that's so like so that that like, and I remember one experience I had was the first the first class I ever took where I saw black and brown students speaking and raising their hands for the first time, and the only class I ever took was African American literature, and that that I saw black and brown students talking. Every other class, you know, nobody, no student of color talks. So how does how could like implementing a cool herc, you know, and and hip hop into curriculum? How could that nurture positive racial identities? And my second question is because you talked about as a woman of color how we don't get as much attention, you know, from you know um, Obama's whole like my brother's keeper and you know forgetting women, and then to the fact that Renisha McBride's murder didn't get the kind of attention that Trayvon Martin's did. So you know, like how. How is it? It seems like nobody is paying attention to the genocide of women of color right now, and yet the the, the and that's not to say that the, the the genocide of black men is being, you know, taken care of, but that I feel like uh, that we don't have we have no name in the in the public, you know, we have and no and I, I don't know I just feel not cared for, you know. Camila, everybody, she's a senior, high school. That's how she's rolling. Two things, I guess. Such a powerful question and really powerful insights. Thank you for sharing them. Um, one, well, I think of course it depends on what the hip hop is, um, but but I think the way that you defined it says so much about who you are and your knowledge of history. First person you said was a Mary Baraka. I mean, that, there it is, our, our Shakespeare in many ways. Mm -hmm. But you know, we, we also, there's another thing too, and I think we, we, we underestimate ourselves in every way, at every turn. There's a scholar who talks about how you have to be a Trojan horse, that you go into a place like this and you can dress the part, you know, you could come in here, you can look, you know, I can, I, I can speak the language, right? And I can be bougie, I could whatever, you know, I throw on my glasses, I'm, I can speak the language, right? Um, but you know, I'm gonna be a Trojan horse. So all of the stories that I have from my life, whether you say they're valid or not, Wherever I go, when I need them, I can open up and out they pour, right? And I feel like, so one of the, one of the, the tasks that we have as the few women of color, who because Marissa Alexander had a newborn when she went to prison, okay, when she went to jail. And I keep, I keep this, this keeps coming to me, I mean, as a mother, of course, but she fired a warning shot to let somebody know, look, don't harm me or my children. And she's losing, and she, but she can't stand her ground. She can't stand her ground. She doesn't, she's not supposed, by, by definition, not supposed to stand, not supposed to have any ground to stand on. So she's a, you're so right, because we are not cared for. And I also was thinking, trying to observe too, as you were saying, you know, because we say this all the time, I'm not saying that black men aren't, you know, also, but we don't hear enough black men saying, I don't, I'm not saying that black women aren't also, and women of color aren't also under siege and under attack at every turn. So we, st we take, you're right, we're not cared for, but we continue to, to, to take care. My, 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 um, reminder is this, is that we have to be fluent, not just in our own languages, but in all of the languages that they say that we shouldn't be fluent in. So get to know that Shakespeare girl, do your Shakespeare, do, but, but, but all, all those people listening to, you know, who are, who are feeling like to become conversant in Shakespeare is enough, it's not enough, because if you wanna ever have a conversation along the lines of the power that you're already demonstrating, then you have to know who Amiri Baraka is, who Sonia Sanchez is, all of these people who are part of that, that battery of stories that you have, so that if somebody wants to engage you in that battle, which they do all the time without even using the language of a battle, but it is a battle, they left their wits at home because you have your whole, you have your whole, your, you have your stories, but you also have their stories. And I think part of what has, has happened is that we've internalized that underestimation when actually that's your most powerful weapon. Please underestimate me because quietly over here when you don't call on me and you say that I don't matter and there's only 3% of us, I got the same statistic at UCSB, I mean and a handful of women of color professors. But I think the, the point is we're forced to be quiet, but that silence 
it's so debilitating, but it's also so powerful because in silence, you know, we're here we are learning, 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 but we have to do something with it. And I think what, the power we have is that we, we talk to our families and our communities and we come here and you refuse to not ask a question. You have to ask a question. You're here, you have to engage. That's who you are. You can see that in your spirit. You have to engage as much as you can. How can we teach other girls to be that way? To not be afraid of their own voices and even if they are, to say it anyway, you know? So really, I mean, I feel like the answer is in the question because you're such a gift. So we thank you so much. That's, and it's, this is when we should have a big hug fest right now. But listen, for all of those people that didn't get a chance to speak, and in the spirit of tradition, and I'm asking everybody to participate in this. We're going, when I go over here, we're going to go peace. When I go over here, we're going to go love. And when I go over here, we're going to go unity. And this is not about being shy. We just sat through a lot of nourishment right now. Okay, so before I do that, I want to say, I want a big shout out to Kathleen Gauger, who is an amazing individual, seriously. That's a behind the scenes person right there. And Janetta, and Professor Guglielmo, please stand up. Seriously. I mean, this is, this is, this is behind, this is, this is the move maker. All right, so as we end, let's all do this in unison. Oh, we got to be louder than that. Come on, y'all, man. Peace, love, unity. And having fun, y'all. Zulu Nation, peace. <laughs>